God is good. How many people know God's doing a good thing? And he's doing a new thing. And what the key is to keep our heart open to what God's doing. Now, the danger is always to say the thing that God's doing now is not as good as what God did before. But the scriptures t- say that, don't say that the days of old were better than these days, for it's not wise to say such things. Uh, we, we talked about this, uh, I don't know if it was Wednesday night, but uh, when, when Haggai had instructed Zerubbabel and Yeshua to, to rebuild the temple, and uh, they finally finished the product, it says at the celebration event, there was the voice of weeping and the voice of shouting at the same time. Because those who had seen the former temple in its glory, which was Solomon's temple, were weeping, while the people who knew God was doing something in their day were rejoicing. And so you've got to be careful. But then the prophet speaks and says to those who are weeping, um, do you not know that, the, that this latter temple is going to exceed the glory of the former one? And they look at it in their natural eyes and say, well, it doesn't have the magnificence, the gold and the, and the precious jewels and the such that Solomon used on that temple. Even, and, and size in comparison, it, it's not there. But, but the prophet says, don't look at things with your natural eyes because God's doing a new thing. And it might not look like much, but when God's in it, little things become big things. Amen. And this temple that God was building here through, the, through these uh, servants that learned to be obedient through a stirring of the spirit uh, would find that that would be the temple that Jesus Christ himself would walk into. And so the glory that was there was found in what everyone had waited for for all the ages. It tells us that Noah and Abraham and Moses and David and, and all Elijah and all the prophets, they looked ahead to that which was not in their generation, but they walked in faith, believing and waiting for that which was before them. Think about this. Because the scriptures were fulfilled when Jesus hung on the cross. You remember, it said the graves were open in the city of Jerusalem. And the saints were around walking in the city of Jerusalem. What were, they, what were they looking at? They were looking at the reality of what they had longed for, which was the person of Jesus Christ. What they had looked to, forward to in faith, they were now experiencing the reality of that. And they get to exp- enjoy the pleasures of it. Some were sorrowful of what was happening, but others were rejoicing over the fact that that which God had promised was coming into into being. Don't ever be mistaken that sometimes the things that look like the worst defeat end up being the greatest victories. I believe that God wants to do a new thing. We were praying last night and it came up, a new beginning, a new beginning. If you can be honest with me this morning, how many people could say I I could use a new beginning? I could use a fresh start. You know, what I wanted to do is I I wanted to just put a whole whiteboard up back here and just begin to write all the things that have become attached to our life. And and I want to just get a big eraser. I just want to picture it in your mind and just wipe wipe that thing clear. And we're starting fresh. Amen. With God, everything that I've, the mistakes I've made, uh, the the, the positive advancements I made, everything. I just want to say, you know, I'm willing to lay it all down and say, let's just start fresh right now. Anybody want a fresh start? Would anybody like a fresh start? We don't have to go to January 1st to say, let's start a, a New Year's resolution. It's not, we don't need to go to the beginning of a new year to say it's time to have a new beginning. We could say, Lord, right now, I'm ready, Lord, for what you have. I want to go where you're leading me, God. I want to start over as such. Right? God offers that to us. He gives that opportunity. I might not be where I want to be, but God, I'm willing to go where you're leading me from where I am right now. Because I can make that decision. I can't, might not be able to change where I am right now, but I can change where I'm going from here. You understand what I'm saying? And so how many people are willing to put one foot in front of the other and say, God, I will go where you lead me? Because when Jesus came to his disciples, he says, drop everything, follow me. Where are we going? You'll find out along the way, but I can guarantee you it's going to be a good new beginning for you. It might lead to some places where you'll question at times, but I can assure you if you keep on walking, you will be blessed because God will always bless obedience and faithfulness. Amen? If you turn in your Bibles with me this morning to uh, Matthew in chapter 16, And, uh, and Jesus is, is right in the middle of, of his miracle working ministry. And how many people know that Jesus still works miracles today? Amen. Anybody believe that? Yeah, let it be unto you as your faith. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and so Jesus is in the middle of it. He had just, he had just uh, miraculously provided uh, for a multitude of people. How many people know that God can, can take little and make it into a much? So that he can multiply the fragments so that everybody can eat and leave completely satisfied. Say, where did that come from? God. You, there's a more than enough today for you to leave full and carry some baskets full home. Amen? And so uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, they're seeking after more signs. They're, they're only interested in one thing. We want miracles because we, like we like the product of the miracles. We like the provision of the miracles, uh, but they don't like the person of the miracles. And, and we're going to learn that the person is what we need to be seeking after, and in the person comes the product. 
And in the miracles comes the provision. Uh, but when we keep our eyes on the person, we don't get bent out of shape and lose sight of priority, which is Christ himself. And so he, he deals with them regarding their hypocrisy that they could discern what this, uh, this is verse 3, what was going on within the, 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 the heavens and, and uh, be able to discern what time of the season it was, what time of the day it was by the sun and the stars and all those things. He says, but you're hypocrites because you don't even understand. You're supposed to be the spiritual leaders and you can understand natural things, but you can't understand spiritual things and you don't know the time that's here. Isn't it scary when spiritual people can discern natural things but can't understand spiritual things? That's hypocrisy. Unfortunately, that's where we find ourselves in much of the church today. I, I think it was A.W. Tozer who said that, um, it was Tozer or Ravenhill, one of the two, said that, um, I think it was Ravenhill actually, said, uh, no, it was Tozer, uh, that a historian can tell you what God did in the past. A historian can tell you what God did in the past. And so often we have so many historians that are standing behind pulpits and occupy positions within the Christian church, and they can tell you what God did. And... Uh, and they could tell you that, but, but there's really no bearing on the, or, or no urgency within the heart. But it takes a prophet to tell you what God is currently doing, what God is currently saying, what God is currently wanting to do. It takes a prophet to understand the now and not just the yesterday. We have too many historians, Christians who could tell you what God did, but have no understanding that God is not the God of yesterday. God is the God of today. God is I am. He's the God of the present. He's not the God of the past. He was the God of the past, and when he was in the past, he was the present, because God always is. And God does not live in the past because he's not locked into time and space, which we do with ourselves and what we do with God. We lock God into the prison of our time and space. And the futility we feel in our lives, we almost ascribe that to God, like the, 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 the own little uh, things that we feel like we have no control over. We make it so God has no control over those things either because we bring God down to a level that we can understand but God stands outside of it all. Does that make sense to everybody? And God wants us to understand that God is a God of the present, and when we learn to walk with God in the present, everything becomes possible. Everything that he wants becomes possible. And so he's doing all these miracles and such and, and rebukes the Pharisees and Sadducees because of their hypocrisy because they didn't know at all what Jesus was really doing. He wasn't just doing miracles for miracles' sake. He was doing it because the kingdom of heaven was present and it was time for repentance to take place. But there was no repentance. There was no change of heart, no change of mind. See, the prison doors were open, but they stayed locked in their cell. Never made a move. But there were those who seemed to be the off-scouring of society that Jesus embraced, and they found that a new day met them when they met Jesus. Didn't matter where they were. Didn't matter if they were homeless. It didn't matter if they were a drug addict. It didn't matter if they were a prostitute. It didn't matter if they were, were dead broke or, or the richest person in the world. It didn't matter that when Jesus came along that they had an opportunity to respond and everything became brand new. It didn't matter where they were. See, God is not, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't set certain people aside as important, others as non-important. And that's why he encourages us that we would show no impartiality with our judgment that we would bless all people alike and respect all people alike. No matter what you have or what you don't have, that God wants you to have what he wants you to have. And in that, all the riches are found. You can be content in everything else. Amen? Everybody with me this morning? And then he goes on to, to instruct his disciples in all the talk of bread that he needs, they need to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they confused even that because they're still thinking about their natural desires. What I wanted to talk about today is this, as we get into the scriptures here in a moment, that we all have our personal preferences. We all have our own desires. We have our tastes, our likes, and our dislikes. We have our affinities. We're, we're, we're predisposed to certain things. Uh, we like it this way, and therefore it's right. This is the way it needs to be done. And that's why many people have marital conflict because they have not learned the secret of surrender of personal affinity. We see so much tension in interpersonal relationships because we haven't learned the secret that my way is not the only way, as much as I believe that it is. And so we think, well, I like this, therefore it's good. Come on. Sounds like a pig to me. Like everything goes. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a pig. I don't want to be rolling around in the mud and I don't want to be eating pods and, and garbage and, you know, 
where it's okay. Just open up garbage sacks, drop it all there. Oh, oh, yum, yum, yum. And it's good. If it's good for me, it's good for everybody. And, and I'm standing there like, dude, you stink and I don't want to be a pig. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm just saying that if you cast your pearls before swine, they'll trample on them. That's what Jesus said. And so we, we come with our personal affinities, the things that we like, the things that we desire. You ever notice that, that our flesh gets us into more trouble than the, than the devil does as Christians? I get an amen on that? Our flesh gets us into more trouble than the devil does. We like to blame the devil on everything, but I'll tell you what, you have more power than you know that you have, and you could surrender that power so easily by giving into the cravings and the desires that you are naturally feeling. A Christian is no longer a natural person. They're a supernatural person. They may believe that, and therefore you're no longer restrained to just operate according to the natural principles. Say, well, that's going to be it's going to be. No, that's not the way it's going to be. God's way is going to be the way it's going to be. It might look like this, but God will prevail in my life, and I will declare that over my life in Jesus' name. Anybody with me? Spiritual people will declare spiritual truths. It might not look like it. That's why faith. What is faith? The substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that I do not see. By faith, the elders obtained a good report. How'd they get a good report? Some of you looking for a good report, and you don't have any faith. You're not going to get a good report without faith. You've got to believe God. You've got to say what God says. You've got to declare what God says. You've got to let that be the truth of your life, what God says. doesn't matter what it looks like. But our personal preferences and our affinities and our attachments to things get us into so much trouble. They do. Come on, so many, I, I believe in my heart of hearts, I believe that God wants to do an incredible ministry of reconciliation in the church of Rhode Island. There's been so many churches started because of splits. And the splits have usually come over the dumbest things. Like blue carpet, who picks blue? You know what I mean? And it's like, who cares? You're just going to walk on it anyway. You know what's on the bottom of your shoe? You know? And anyway, I'm a little bit of a germaphobe. Not too bad. But if you really think about it, but when you're in the presence of God, it doesn't even matter. You're facing the carpet, you know? Like, who cares? But what I'm saying is that we got to learn to surrender what we think we want for what God wants us to have, knowing that his will is better. We know that, but we don't know that. Like, we know that. How many people have, like, you're driven by your feelings more than you are of what you really know to be true? How many people have done something contrary to your conscience? How many people have done something contrary to your conscience? Like, you knew this is not what you're supposed to do, but for whatever reason, like, you wanted it. And, like, even in your mind, you knew that this is going to be a dumb thing, dumb decision. I'm going to pay for it later, but I'm going to do it anyway. I mean, how many people have done that? Like, why? Because there's a strong desire in our life for things that we do not need, which we think we want. Right back to the garden. There's only one tree they can't eat of. It's the root of sin, which is thinking that we need something that's been, and something's been withheld from us that we really want, and good is being, re re held, uh, being held back from us by God, that we somehow along the line, if you want to go down a bad road, you'll start the bad road believing this, that God is withholding something from you that's good. And you need to explore outside the parameters of that he set for you in order to find that good that's being withheld. You want to find a prison door that will lock you up real quick? Adam and Eve forfeited the garden because they somehow were convinced that God was withholding something from them outside of the parameters that he set for them. You can have anything you want, just don't touch this. And people say, well, why would God do that? Because if he didn't do that, then we'd be a bunch of robots. We would. We would not know what it is to walk in obedience to his will. Would we? Think about it this way. The Apostle Paul writes that I didn't even know what lust was, until I was given the commandment, thou shalt not covet. And as soon as the commandment came, you shall not covet, or you should not want this, all of a sudden, because I was told I can't have this, all of a sudden, I wanted to have what I couldn't have. And the law began to produce in me all means of unrighteousness, that the law did that. See, that's the boundaries. God has set boundaries in our lives. What are boundaries for? Because God is mean? No, because he wants to reveal what is inside the human heart that the human heart always gravitates towards what they think is best. And what they think is best is best, doesn't matter what anybody else says. You know it, everybody in here is a bunch of stiff-necked people. Hard-headed, 
hard-headed. Think about all the conflicts you've had at different times. Come on, just go back in your mind. Think of the arguments you had with your mom, your dad, your wife, your husband, your kids. Think about some of them. And you say, I'm an idiot. Like, why would I argue about that? Why did I take such a strong stand on something that didn't even matter? And I was wrong. But aren't we driven to that point of always wanting what we want? Don't we always want what we want? We do. And what happened here is, is the people thinking that this is what we want. We want more bread because we want to be full in our belly. We like to be satisfied. We like good things. We like nice things. And Jesus is like, can, can I show you what's really important? Beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Because their teaching will infiltrate every aspect of your life. It's like leaven. And when you learn to gravitate yourself and think that your way is the best way, it will infiltrate every area and avenue of your life. You will constantly be fighting everyone on personal preference. Always. Catch me on this. It's the truth. You will always have to be right. Even when you're wrong, you'll press the point to be right because you have to prove that you were right and every other time you were right. And so now another conflict arises. You have to be right again because you have to prove that I'm always right. I'm always right. And that's the human condition. And I want what I want. doesn't matter what anybody says to it. And if you say something contrary, shut off. I can't hear you. I see your mouth talking, but no words are coming out. And so Jesus deals with them on the point of their lack of faith and little understanding. And he begins to, to teach them that he's got a, a better way. And we get to verse 13. This is what's going on in the beginning of chapter 16. We get to verse 13. And when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Why, why would Jesus ask this question at this time? Because Jesus, for a lot of people, became the means of their pleasure the means of having their desires granted. The multitudes followed him everywhere he went. I always wanted to see a miracle. I always wanted to see a miracle. I've never seen a miracle before. You can't tell me people aren't interested in the miraculous. I mean, we see the billboards out on 95, Chris Angel and, and all these other guys, and they're doing supernatural things and such. Like, we got to go find out where these mysteries of people that can manipulate nature in order to do things. And, and there's a fascination. You could fill up auditoriums with people, wh whether they're true magicians or not. I heard a guy on the radio the other day saying all magicians, they, they operate according to sleight of hand, and there is no powers behind it. I'm like, are you crazy, dude? You don't think there's powers of darkness? Even saying, like, the Egyptians and in, 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 uh, the, the, the magicians in the Egyptian court we're operating according to sleight of hand and deception and not actually true spiritual wickedness and power. I'm like, I'm like, you don't understand spiritual darkness at all. There's a reality of manipulation of nature. I, just uh, on, uh, There's a positive Warwick and, and somebody just posted out, young lady, like I, I do tarot card readings and all this other stuff. I'm not like this, I'm like this, I do it for the good and stuff like that. And I'm like, there's such an intrigue with spiritual matters. Like people are drawn to that. I mean, look at the amount of palm readers and and soothsayers that are all over our community because people are intrigued to know something that they didn't know before. Come on, people have become miracle chasers. And you could chase Jesus for the wrong reason. And you could say, I'm a Christian. I go to this church and I go to the this meeting, I go to this meeting, I go to this meeting. And your heart could be so far away because everything that drives you is personal desire. And God wants to cut to the heart of really what moves us. I mean, I could prove to you that, that, that miracles often drove many people because Herod, if you remember, after Jesus had been arrested by Pontius Pilate, he says, uh, bring Jesus to me because I want him to do a miracle for me. You remember Herod? Herod wanted Jesus to be brought to his courts and he just wanted Jesus to do something miraculous. Can you imagine having your heart so hard that you can have the Son of God who brings salvation standing before you and you're more interested in him suiting your fancy than him bringing you into everlasting life? And so many people have forfeited in the Christian church, suiting my fancy, meeting my needs, you know, meeting that immediacy of, of having some type of connection. And people leave say, I felt the presence and there was a power. There was like this, um, uh, what's the word that's often used? There was an energy in that place. I'm like, dude, you need to get past the energy part. You need to get to the saving power and the grace of Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit. It's not about just positive energy. It's about saving power. 
because people are chasing all kinds of different things and there's all types of different types of Jesus is that in the world. So Jesus had to ask his own disciples, who do men say that I am? Verse 14 says, so they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Which is interesting to me because each one of them that he mentions was at some point persecuted by those who said that they were his people. Isn't that interesting? John the Baptist lost his head. Elijah almost did, right? Jeremiah was thrown into a pit to, dr- to, to starve to death. Can't really think of a worse way of dying than that. Let's stand in a muddy, nasty pit with rats and stuff and just stand there until I die because I starved to death and die of thirst. That sounds like a really great way to die. And so they say all these people and they forget that there was a, a dichotomy going on between the reality of what was spoken about them and how they were actually treated. But anyway, um, he said to them, but, but who do you say that I am? And that's the question that always hits us at the heart of who we are. Amen? Who do you say that I am? A.W. Tozer, in the beginning of his book, Knowledge of the Holy, said this, the most important thing about any individual is what that person thinks when they think God. Like when I say God, what, what immediately comes into your mind? When I say God, what comes into your mind? Something came into your mind. That right? If I say bike, you're going to picture something. When I say God, what comes into your mind? He says, what comes into your mind when you think God is the most important thing about any person? For a person's religion will rise or fall based upon their perception of what God is like. He said, no person or group of people can ever rise above their perception of what God is like. That we will, by a secret nature of the soul, move towards our mental image of what God is like. The mental image that we've created. How many people know the mental images that we create are based upon our own personal preferences? How many people know that? And that's why the Greek gods looked like the Greek gods looked, and why the Roman gods look like the Roman gods look, why Buddha looks like Buddha looks, and why the Hindu gods look like they look, because it's all based upon personal preference of the people groups. Think about this, and I want to, I want to just press this point. Religion is bondage. And religion always seeks to appease the people's opinion of what they think God should be like. So let's have a conversation. Let's, 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 let's call a convention and let's have a discussion. Well, well God, you know, he, he should be pretty. So let's give him blue eyes and blonde hair. He should have at least some realm of power, so let's, let's give him authority over the clouds and the, and the weather patterns. He, he should, he should want to do what we want. I mean, he should hate his enemies because we hate our enemies. He should be a little bit... Um, uh, adverse to conflict and so therefore make him a little bit moody and we, we we shape and mold god into an image that we're comfortable with think about it we do it as christians and we're we're, we're we got to be come to a place of god i need absolute repentance for the form and image i made you into we, we try to blame the catholics for all the statues that they have up but christians have carved their own in their hearts I'm not trying to be hard on you today. I just want to get down to the reality of what God wants to do in our lives. And so Jesus asked the question, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, or son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Did you catch that? That the revelation of Jesus did not come by his intelligence or by his personal opinion, but it came from God the Father. That if anyone has any encounter with God, it's not going to be because you became more intelligent, but because you responded to God's invitation. He began to reveal to you that this is truth. See, what I love about preaching is that I'm not just throwing out some fancy words to you. I'm preaching to you the words that are able to change your life, not because I'm convincing, but because the word of God is power. And Jesus' answer said to him, blessed, blessed, but it's not been revealed by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. Verse 18, And I say to you that you're Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church. The gates of hell, or the gates of Hades, shall not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. I find that really interesting. That's the next statement. So, in other words, can you imagine that promise? So Jesus has the right response because God quickened his spirit to be able to respond correctly to who Jesus was. And what does Jesus say to Peter? 
that you've just received an incredible amount of blessing. Jesus spoke blessing upon him that now you have a name that is an identification with the church of Jesus Christ. And therefore, with that identification in Christ as the church, you've been given the authority of the church. And therefore, the things that I am revealing unto you in demonstration, you're going to be able to walk out as well in power. And Peter's like, And I'm sure Peter, knowing Peter, would walk about. Hey, hey, John, you hear him? Hey, Thomas, how you like me now? And and uh, and you you could think about what was going on. Because we know in the heart of Peter, he was driven by preference, wasn't he? Jesus takes him to the Mount of Transfiguration, and he didn't know what to say. But when you don't know what to say, let's just say something. Let's build three tabernacles for ourselves here. And what does he do? He, he's moving according to what he knows. And we, we base what we do upon what we know, and we think what we know and what we do is right. And we get ourselves into a whole lot of trouble. Don't we? I want to just read a little bit more here. I told you I wasn't going to take you too long, but um, we, we, we keep reading. And, um, but Jesus had to let them know that <laughs> Greater revelation is going to come, so, so don't be stupid with the knowledge you just got. <laughs> so don't say anything, right? You ever feel that way? Like, God's still working things out in my life. I'm better off not saying anything quite at this point about what it is that I'm kind of working through. Work, work through before you talk through. Amen. Amen. Anyway, verse 21, and, and from this time, from the time that he has this conversation with Peter, right? From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. That's an interesting timing, isn't it? So Jesus just said to Peter that you're going to walk in an incredible power and authority. But from that time on, he began to preach the gospel of the cross. The cross. See, the new beginnings are going to come through the cross and they're not going to come through our own means or our own desires or our own affinities. We're going to realize that when we learn to surrender our life, it's there we take our life up. We keep reading, it says this, and then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. What just happened a few minutes ago? Who, are, who am I? You're the Christ. You're the Son of God. I mean, he's basically saying, you, you, are, you are divine. You created everything. And now he's like, hey, Jesus, come here one second. Can you stop talking about this stuff? Because it's really kind of cramping my style. I like the keys to the kingdom of heaven, but crosses, come on, get rid of the crosses. That message will never remove itself from the flesh. The flesh will always find contrast with the cross. We'll like the authority part. We'll like the power gifts. We'll like this and we'll like that, but we don't like the cross. We don't like talk and discussion about the cross. We don't like suffering. We don't like to deal with blood and all that other stuff, unless it's gore and horror and all this other stuff that the world has, has preference towards. Now, I don't even get it. But when it comes to blood that actually cleanses and forgives, rather than horrifies and scares, we don't want anything to do with it. And so Peter takes Jesus aside and starts to rebuke Jesus. Can you imagine rebuking Jesus? Can anybody imagine rebuking Jesus? Like telling Jesus, you don't got it right. I got it right. Can you imagine the pride of the human condition where we get to the point of preference, where our preference exceeds the preference of Jesus, the creator? You guys with me this morning? Like literally to the point where saying, God, your way is not the way it's supposed to be done. This is the way it's supposed to be done. That's what Peter was saying. See what was driven there? Let's just keep reading for one second. I, give me five more minutes. Is that, is that fair? And, um, and he turns around and said to Peter, Mark actually says he turns around and says to his disciples, get behind me, Satan, for you are an offense to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. You're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. And then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gain the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. And then he moves again to the transfiguration. Peter's still not getting it. But I want to just look at this just for a few minutes here. 
um, there's two different type of personalities that I've learned in my life. Uh, there's the reactive personality, and then there's the responsive personality. The reactive personality deals with, with, with circumstances as they arise. Reactive. Something happens and I react to that. I react to it. I'm not dealing necessarily in, in foreknowledge, forethought, or anything else. I'm just dealing with the moment in the moment. Right? It's, um, it's showing response to a stimulus. It's acting in response to a situation rather than acting, rather than creating or controlling it. It's, it's about... It's about responsiveness. It's about res uh, constantly reacting to the things that happen in our lives. Peter was a reactionary, wasn't he? Something would happen, Peter would react. You know, they would come out in the garden, Peter would pull out a sword. They would go up on the mountain, he would make a quick statement. They would do this, they would do that. Jesus would make a statement that was incredibly deep and, and going to bring about tremendous healing and power to the church, and, Jesus, and, and, and Peter rebukes Jesus. Peter was, he was reactive. You know what reactive is based upon? Personal preference. We, re we, re we react to things like, you cut me off. How dare you cut me off? I'm the most important person in the world to whatever with you, you know? And that we, we deal that way. We react to circumstances as they arise. Because so many of us s spend so little time actually preparing for future. A, a culture is rising up that has, knows nothing about projection about tomorrow. Everything is respond to right now in the immediate. And so I can make really dumb decisions that are going to have consequences later in my life, but I don't even think about the consequences later in my life because I'm, I, I'm a reactionary person. Right? Isn't that true? I, I'll take it as it comes. And so what happens is when you and I cross, I'll react to that. And reactive people never really build real good relationships, do they? We have a tendency to to kind of continue to burn bridges, don't we? Doesn't that happen? I mean, think about it. Learn, we, we react. How many people have said words that they wish they never said? Because you reacted to a circumstance without really thinking about it. You just reacted to the immediacy of that. And that's the way Peter's responding here. He reacts to it with no forethought or, 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 or projection as to really what Jesus was trying to communicate. If from that time Jesus began to teach, and, and because Peter was so much a reactive person, as Jesus continued to teach on the cross, Peter continued to miss all the signs and just continued to react to every moment as it arose. You guys with me this morning? And God was trying to prepare people that were responsive people. Responsive people. People that had been trained for a particular response in the light of situations. How many of you, if you'd be honest, spend time actually preparing for things that lie before you? I, my wife was in emergency preparedness, her job before the one she's in now. And they did emergency preparedness for, for four hospital systems in the state of Rhode Island. And what they would do, her whole job was based on the premise that something may happen, and therefore we need to know how to respond to it when it does happen. It may never happen. And if it never happens, it doesn't mean your job was worthless. It means that you were prepared for what would by ahead. We say, well, that's a waste of money. That's a waste of time. That's a waste of energy. Think about it. How many people buy snowblowers in the summer? Now, when do you buy a snowblower? When the blizzard hits and everybody else needs a snowblower. Because I didn't prepare and I wasted all my money on Dunkin' Donuts and going out to eat. So I don't have enough money to buy a snowblower when I could really use it and get a better deal on it. I'll wait for the time where the blizzard hits and I'll pay $600 when I could have got it for $300 if I had prepared in advance. It wasn't a reactive person, it was a responsive person. Anybody with me this morning? And God wants to prepare for us to be a type of people who learn that the, 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 the cross is not something that we should shun because reactionary thing to that is, I don't want the cross suffering. I don't want patience. I don't want that stuff. I don't want anything that brings that in my life. But the responsive person says, God, you're leading me and giving me the foresight and the wisdom and the spiritual projection to see this is where you want to take me. And the only way to get there is through there. And therefore, I embrace this out of the response of insight into that which lies before me. Anybody with me this morning? And God wants to teach us to be a type of people who don't come in to say, well, Jesus didn't work for me. It didn't go the way that I had expected. It's time to let your preference die and start to embrace the reality that Christianity's emblem is not your personal opinion. It's a cross. It's a cross. It's a cross. If anyone's unwilling to take up the cross and follow me, he's not worthy to be a disciple. 
I have more I could say, and I wanted to even talk about the whole idea of the way we think. But in Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul said that there's a way of thinking. It's, it's the Greek word's phroneo, and it's about our projection or the process of which we think. And there's those who are the enemies of the cross. This is found in chapter 3 of Philippians, verses 18 and 19. There's those who are the enemies of the cross, and they live as enemies of the cross because their God is their belly or their appetite. They glory in their shame or their... Um, their trophy is their sin. And they set their mind on earthly things, natural things. They want what they want. And they don't realize what's good for them and what's not good for them. And so we continue to chase after the things that are temporary and have no lasting value to them. We run after those things that are ultimately destroying us. But because we've been so programmed just to respond to events as they come, we've never learned the secret of taking a step back and begin to evaluate that maybe God wants me to live in the future and not die in my stupidity. Maybe God has blessing prepared for me as I walk through this valley. And therefore, I will respond correctly in the midst of trial and, and what seems like torment and cross-carrying because I know that it doesn't end here. The blessing lies before me and I've learned to respond because the Spirit is quickening within me and showing me that this is not it. There's more to come. Is anybody in here have the Spirit of God in them and revealing to them that there's more than you're currently walking in? And from this point on, you can say, God, I'm ready for a brand new beginning. I'm ready to move into the things that you have and I will not be afraid of the process, okay? And, and four points I just want to give you as I close, okay? There are four Ps and you can write these down if you want because as we're dealing with the conversation with Jesus and Peter, we can see that Peter's all full of his own desires, right? He wants what he wants and he wants it by the means of which he wants it. He wants it to come. He wants power, but he wants that power without cost. He wants authority and he wants the privilege of being somebody. He wants a crown, but he doesn't want a cross. He wants a throne, but he doesn't want a thorn. Amen? And so Jesus deals with it on four issues. First, he deals with us with the person, which is Jesus. Or we could make it C's. We call him the Christ. Okay? The person. Second, we see before he has this whole conversation and leads him to the point, Jesus knew where he was leading Peter. See, Jesus was not a reactive person. Jesus was always responsive. He responded to every circumstance correctly. Why? Because Jesus was not reactive. If Jesus was a reactive person, think about this. Jesus had foresight, didn't he? Jesus could see things that no one else saw. Amen? When they put a bag on his head and began to punch his face and say, prophesy to us, prophesy to us, who's punching you? A reactionary person would be like, boom, and knocked them all out. Say, yeah, that's me. Who's your daddy now? <laughs> and that would have been a reactive person. But a responsive person could see you and me sitting here today and say, if I do what God asked me to do, I can project and see the joy that lies before me and therefore endure the cross, despise its shame, because you've prepared for me to sit down on a throne. Anybody with me today? When you embrace the cross, you realize that you're embracing, the, you're embracing the throne. The cross is the only means of the Christian faith. Every other religion has personal preference written all over it. Jesus says personal preference got to go to a cross. And that's the emblem of the Christian faith. You with me? Christianity is distinct from any other religion. Religion always has preference in mind. But when we're dealing with true, unadulterated, faith in God, personal preference has to die. It has to die. On every level, it has to die. There's things in our own hearts in this room right now that make us do things and say things and respond in particular ways to people that are also God's people that are not pleasing to God because of our own personal preference. And Jesus is like, you got to take up a cross. <sighs> but that's the, that's the Christian faith. To die to self and to live unto God. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Everything's gone. That's old. My way of thinking too, folks. My way of thinking too. In fact, when Jesus came, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do you know what the word repentance means? It means change of thought. Change of thought. Repentance at its core is this. Change the way you think. Change the way you think. Because if you keep thinking the way you're thinking, you're going to keep going down the roads of Adam and Eve. And you're going to keep forsaking your own mercy for pleasure. And you're going to keep finding yourself kicked outside the garden that was yours to dwell in. Catch me on this. So we, first we have the person, Jesus the Christ. Second, we have the promise, which we see with Peter's authority. We'll, we'll call it with the C, the crown. 
okay? So we have the person of Christ and we have the promise of the crown, right? I'll give you keys. It was authority, it was a crown. How many people knew when they came into the faith, like you came into the faith and it's like the first thing was not, you know, a lot of times it's like, man, God's got good things for me, right? Anybody coming excited to the faith? Like God's got good things for me. Like this is exciting. And, uh, and then the cross came up. You're like, oh, 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 time out. I didn't sign up for this. And God's like, no, this is part of the, the next one. This is part of the process, the next P. So we have the person, we have the promise, and then we have the process. You catch that? The process. Many people want to avoid the process. We like the promise without the process. We like the crown without the cross. So we have the Christ, the crown, and the cross, or the person, the promise, and the process. Amen. Anybody with me this morning? I'm, I'm closing here in literally one minute. The person, the promise, the process. The Christ, the crown, and the cross. So many people want to bypass process in order to come to what they want. But how many people know with God you don't get to call the shots? In fact, the very core of our understanding as believers is this, from the get-go, that Jesus Christ has placed his spirit on us as head. Christ is the head of his church. He's the one who calls the shots. In fact, when we anoint, we anoint the head. The head is a sign of authority. The head is a sign of of, of decision making, right? When we anoint with oil, people say, I want an anointing. Yeah, what you're doing is saying, I want the control of the Holy Spirit on my life. I want to be under his lordship. I want to be the spirit of God that directs my life. I don't longer want to be the one holding the wheel and driving my life. This is, wait, Lord, we're going to go over here. I like it over here. We're going to eat this, drink this, do this, that, and the other thing. And God's like, well, there's no anointing there. Because the anointing is about you being dread and dre- driven and led by the Holy Spirit. That's an anointing. You understand? Because the anointing upon the head is control of the Spirit of God. Anybody with me this morning? See, we like to avoid the cross. We want the crown, but the crown comes with the cross because we see Jesus laid down perfectly how humankind should live because through the cross came death, but through the death came resurrection. And resurrection is more power than just life by itself existing. See, no one just rises from the dead. That's the power of God at work. See, people are born in their mother's womb, but it's, which is a gift of God, but Everyone, even natural people, experience that. See, they were born once, born of the water, but we've been born of the Spirit. You with me this morning? And see, God has called us to, and caused us to go down into a grave so that we have risen up with Christ, and therefore we live no longer alive to ourselves, but alive unto God, who loved us and gave himself for us. And the life we live now, we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and surrendered his life for us. And we walk now in this authority and this power that I didn't know was there until I embraced the cross and I realized the crown was shown me before the cross because God knows that if you show the cross before the crown, everybody runs. And the final thing we come to is the product. So we have the person, the promise, the process, and then the product. And this is the product. It's called the spirit-filled believer or the spirit-filled life. Anybody with me this morning? There's authority in the spirit-filled life. Not a lot of people walk in the spirit-filled life. I'm, I'm finding that more and more the more I walk with Jesus. Not a lot of people walk in the spirit-filled life. I'm not as spirit-filled as I want to be. Amen? I want more. I want more. I want more of you, Jesus. Uh, so we have the Christ, the cross. We have the Christ, the crown, the cross, and finally, uh, we'll call it the carrier, the carrier. How many people would like to be a carrier this morning? Can we stand to our feet? Let's stand to our feet. Jose, you can jump on the keyboard. <laughs> the cross is not to be shunned, folks. I want to just, I'm sharing this this morning, especially for those who have made commitments to Christ just recently. We have a lot of young believers in this congregation. The cross is the emblem and the anthem of our faith. The cross is. What that means is, I got to die, guys. Ladies, gentlemen, we got we to die. It's not about Jesus. You're added to my preference list. You're another one of my likes on Facebook. It's time for us to say, Lord, I want to get my face in your book and learn that my life's not my own. It's been bought at a precious price, the blood of Jesus Christ. It's time for me to begin to embrace, Lord. It's not about what I want. It's about what you want. It's not what I think is best, God. It's what you know is best. Because you've prepared me for good works before I was aware of what you were doing, when your grace was calling me, while I was locked up in my sin, your plan was for me to bear fruit for you. You called me to be a carrier of the glory of God as a spirit-filled believer in Jesus Christ. That's your plan, Lord. And so you reveal the person, through the person, you give the promise of the crown, and then you show us that the only way to really walk that out is through the cross. 
Because the flesh, the natural mind is at war with God. We will fight against God. Say, God, you can't do it that way. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit my personal preference. God, no. He says, well, if it's no there, it's no for you walking out what I want for you. You've forsaken your own mercy by your own opinion and desire. Because anyone who would find his life will lose his life. But he who surrenders and loses his life for my sake, the same will find his life. I ask you a question this morning. What would you be willing to surrender your soul for? What would you surrender your soul for? What would it profit a man if he gained everything in this world and lost his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? I believe that God is, is calling us out. Take a real personal evaluation of what's going on inside our hearts. When God says no, the answer is no. It's time for us to Lord, learn the word lordship. It's what we embrace when we embrace the cross. Lord, you call the shots. You call the means. You ordain the process. You make the product. I'm just along for the ride. And I get to embrace and experience the glory of God working through this frail human vessel. If you're willing to say yes, God meets you there. If you're willing to say yes to the cross, then you'll experience the power of the resurrected life. The power of God at work through you.